great study has been. The title of our message tonight is called Making Choices. You know, we make hundreds of choices throughout the day. Most of the choices you make, you don't give a lot of thought to. Some of them you think more about. Some of the choices we make include what time you're going to leave for work, what time you're going to show up someplace, how fast you're going to drive getting there. Are you going to drive the speed limit or just a little over? These are choices we make. P different people make different types of choices or arrive to choices differently. And I think the best way to illustrate this is to talk about the way that men and women order food at a restaurant. I don't know how it works in your house. And to be honest, this could flip-flop. It could be the man, it could be the woman. Usually it's an opposite kind of a personality. But I'll describe a typical um, restaurant experience, at least with my house. Uh, we go to a restaurant, and, and within five minutes of walking through the front door, I know what I'm going to get. The menus arrive, I already know, based upon the choices, what type of restaurant we're in, American food, breakfast food, whatever it is, I know what I like, I find it on the menu, I might be intrigued by some options, but I've narrowed it down fairly quickly, I know exactly what I'm going to eat. And so I wait. My wife, on the other hand, takes a little longer to make choices. She likes to have options. When we go out to eat, normally the decision-making process doesn't start until the second time the, the person's come to the table to ask, are you ready to order? That's when the decision starts being processed. The biggest piece of information which will decide what she orders for dinner is usually based on the first question, which is, honey, what are you getting? Now, when I was younger, I made poor choices in how I responded to that. My typical response was, what difference does it make what I'm getting? I'm getting what I want to eat. You're going to get what you want to eat. And there may not be enough on my plate for me to share anything. I'm going to get what I want to eat. So I don't understand why you need to know what I'm going to get in order for you to order food. But I've grown and matured in this area. <laughs> now I simply respond with what it is that I'm going to order. The second or the third step in this process usually involves the waiter coming over once she's narrowed down to choices, then she has questions, right? There are questions about what to order. I've learned usually to order an appetizer on the first time around so that I can process this with her. Once she's asked the choices, she'll order something like vegan something and add chicken to it, which to me... It's her choice, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Why order a vegan tray and then add meat to it? Why don't you add the chicken thing and add the vegan? I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't know why she makes choices. On the other hand, when we have to make choices together, she usually makes very good choices because she thinks them out a lot longer than I do. We balance each other out this way. But we make so many choices throughout the day, and sometimes our choices have very small consequences to them, such as where I'm going to eat. Not a big consequence. But other times in life, we make choices that have long-term consequences. And by consequences, I just simply mean result. There's, for every action, there's a reaction. You make a choice, and there will be something that comes along with it. Right? Sometimes we make choices that end up with long-term benefits, such as marrying the person whom God has brought to you. Other times, though, in life, we make bad choices. You ever made a bad choice? Once, once made, we made one bad choice in your whole life. The bottom line is, just as humans, and with our limited information on this side of heaven, at times, we make bad choices. Sometimes the choices are completely unavoidable. A bad choice sometimes is when we have information to the otherwise, but for whatever reason, we choose what we choose, and then we have to live with that choice. My question to you is, how do you respond after you make bad choices? Because we're all going to make bad choices. This is inevitable. We will all make bad choices at some point. Sometimes the choices have negative long-term consequences. But how you respond to those bad choices will determine whether or not they end up being really bad choices later on, whether the consequences continue, such as if you make a bad choice, how do you respond? Do you blame people? Do you blame God? Or do you... Submit to your choice, 
give it to the Lord and allow him to bring you through it. Well, the nation of Israel, man, we have read, we have read not just in the book of Samuel, but in many of our other studies, there is a string that runs from Genesis all the way through Revelation, and it is this, that obedience brings blessings and disobedience brings consequences. We see it all throughout the scriptures. When they obeyed God and they, they feared him and they followed his word, God blessed the nation of Israel. And then at some point, we see this seven times throughout the book of Judges, they simply decide that they're going to worship false gods. Oh, they don't make that conscious decision, but they're tempted to worship these false gods of the lands, and then they start slow and then kind of end up worshiping more and more, and pretty soon, God is far in the background of their life, and they're all on to idol worship, which is how it happens in our lives as well. And we've made, pet, we've made a bad choice. How do we get back on track with that? And how does the nation of Israel get back on track with it? Tonight we're going to see. If your Bibles are open, 1 Samuel chapter 12, read with me verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice and all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. And I am old and gray-headed. And look, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night. Lord, I, th I thank you for, Lord, this, this, this time that we come together midweek, Lord. If Sundays are just not enough. One day a week, Lord, that's, that's, that's good. But, Father, when we come together in these midweek times, it's such a blessing. And it's such a, a, a neat group of, of, of Christians, the Lord, believes you brought together to study your word. Or for those who will be watching this later on and on the video, Father, I pray that you will bless this teaching, Lord. I pray that you will teach us your truth. Teach us to walk in your ways, Lord. Uh, teach us, Lord, to be a light in this world. Fill us, Lord, with your joy, our purpose, and your truth. And in Jesus' name, amen. So Samuel and the nation of Israel, along with King Saul, are in Gilgal. Now in chapter 11 we read that there was a guy named Nahash. Nahash literally translates to snake or serpent. He had come as one of the Ammonites. The Ammonite people are from, from the east of Jordan. We know it today as Ammon, Jordan, uh, or excuse me, east of Israel in Ammon, Jordan. We know it today as that, but that's the area that they came from. There was a large army. They had surrounded uh, Jabesh Gilead and, and, and given them a choice, either surrender or we kill you all and take your stuff. And they sent for somebody, they sent basically for a savior. They needed some help. Um, and so he waited, Nahash did, they sent out, the word got back to King Saul, and this was really King Saul's first kingly duty. Because we find out that after he was anointed king and the whole nation accepted him, with the exception of a group of what we know as a, a, a few people, rebels the Bible calls them, they didn't accept Saul as king, they weren't happy that he was anointed, and they, they weren't going to back him. Then Saul just sort of went back to work. He sort of went back and he's plowing in the fields, which is not what we associate with normal king duties. But the word gets to him. He finds out and he gathers. It says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. He sent, cuts up an ox and sends the pieces out all over Israel and says, this is going to happen to your oxen if you don't come and fight. The fear of the Lord fell on everybody. They put together an army of about 330,000 men, and they go and take out Nahash. Now, when this happens and Jabesh Gilead is saved, the nation of Israel has had triumph over their enemies. Saul was the man that God had used to bring everybody together. And after this victory, this big spiritual victory, the nation of Israel, that national fervor is at its like peak. They are probably waving, make Israel great flags again, you know, all over Israel. They are stoked about this new direction, and it's, and it's exciting, and, and, and Saul is king, and, and you know, they want to go back to Gilgad, and they sort of want to redo the ceremony, but this time with everybody on board. However, we found out there was a group of people that wanted to root out those guys that didn't support him in the first place and kill him, and Saul says, no, we're not going to handle things that way. This is the day the Lord has made. God has given us this victory. We're not going to start killing ourselves. So they go back to Gilgal. Samuel is going to sort of redo the ceremony, but there's a lot more to it this time around that he is going to remind them of. And so as he brings them uh, to Gilgal, he says, I have heeded your voice and all that you said to me and has made a king over you. Now, this is the first time in chapter 12. He's going to do this a couple of times, but in the first time in chapter 12, that he reminds Israel that they made a choice. 
It was their choice for a king. He says, I've heeded your voice. You asked for the king, and I've given you a king on behalf of the Lord. He says, now here is the king. He's walking before you. Now he, he identifies himself as old and gray-headed. <laughs> Normally, judges don't, don't retire. Okay, this is the first time, really, Samuel, he's going to be replaced. Normally, a judge is a judge until he dies. Now, he's not stepping down from being a judge per se, but he's no longer going to be in leadership in Israel. King Saul is now going to be the, the leader, the anointed leader of God. He is sort of, the, there's this transition that's happened. Now that God has worked a great victory through Saul, Saul is now king. Everybody's behind it. We've sort of transitioned now from, uh, from really a theocracy where, where God was in charge and his prophet, uh, or, or Samuel was a prophet and he was a judge of Israel at the same time. But now it's transitioned to the king. So he's kind of stepping back and he's saying, I am old and gray-headed. In other words, I, I'm, I'm moving towards retirement now. He is selling his house in Jerusalem and moving to Punta Gorda next week. That's where he's at right now. It says, I am walking before you. I'm old and gray-headed. And look, my sons are with you. This is an interesting statement. In other words, his sons, if we remember right, weren't necessarily walking with the Lord. They were starting out in ministry, but they weren't doing very well. Saul, or excuse me, Samuel took his boys out of ministry. They no longer work for the Lord. They're now with Israel. He's pointing this out. He didn't, he didn't do like Eli was going to do where he's had his sons, you know, come and kind of sort of take his place until God was the one that brought Samuel, right? Remember his mama uh, dropped him off at the temple. He grew up in the temple, or excuse me, the tabernacle. Um, so he's, he's pointing out, I have taken my sons out. He says, King Saul is now with you. And he says, I've walked before you from my childhood to this day. Samuel had been serving the nation of Israel since he was about three years old. His mama dropped him off at the tabernacle, and you remember the story, chapters one and two. Mama drops him off there, and she used to drop off baby clothes, but, but she would copy the priest's clothes, make him a little baby ephod, three, four years old, running around in priest clothes. And he was raised literally in the tabernacle under Eli. Transition took place, and he became the judge. And so he does something here. Verse 3, he says, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. That's That took bravery right there. That took courage. Can you imagine a world leader Stepping up in front of his own country and saying, whom have I cheated? Is there anybody that could have done that in the United States? Whom have I cheated? Uh, well, let me see. Wait, wait, wait a second. Let's take, you know, who, who's, whose money have I taken? Well, that pretty much includes everybody, right? I mean, my goodness. He puts this out there to the nation of Israel. Anybody with any accusation, he's bringing it out in front of him. Every, he's giving them the platform. Have I cheated anybody? Have I taken your oxen? Have I taken your donkey? Has anybody ever given me a bribe so that I would pervert justice? He puts it all out there and he says, put it out there. Make your accusation. I'm ready to make it right. Even if there's something that I didn't know I did, bring it forward. What do the people say? Verse 4. And they said, you have not cheated or oppressed us nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Oh, man. Wow. That is integrity. That is integrity. Samuel is somebody who is finishing strong. You know how many people start out well and finish horribly? I think in the last several years, it seems so often that I'm reading articles about pastors or big-time worship leaders in the country that are, that are falling all over. And there's, 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 you know, and then I read the story, and, and you know, you, you find out how it happens in the end, but then you, you think to yourself, well, this didn't happen in a vacuum. This didn't just happen all by itself. And oftentimes you read these articles, and, and it goes back, and there were accusations made over a long period of time. There's just, there wasn't a lot of integrity. Now, I know that there are challenges, and I'm well acquainted with the challenges of ministry. And no man is above making a mistake, or falling, or stuff like this, but these aren't mistakes that, 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 that you know, they, it's not like they, they slipped and fell. I mean, these were thought about making bad choices. So often this is happening, but Samuel is such a great 
example of a man who was able to stand up in front of the entire nation and say, anybody got an accusation on anything I've ever done wrong, bring it forward now, and nobody could. Nobody did. Verse 5, he, then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed, he's speaking of King Saul, his anointed, is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. So later on, that's not, I mean, you might be asking the question, why did he do this? Was he just simply trying to prove a point? Was he trying to just puff himself up and say, look at me, I haven't done anything wrong, I'm retiring? And, no, that's not, that's not what he's doing here. What he's doing here is he is setting the stage, knowing the hearts of men, that later on, this, this whole wanting a king thing is going to backfire on them. It's not because it was wrong to have a king. It, the motivation for wanting the king was wrong. And he knew that when choices are made with the wrong motive, oftentimes it's going to end up with a poor result. He just knew this. And so he didn't want anybody coming back and saying, well, we only chose a king because you were a horrible leader. No, I can call you right back to this moment. The Lord is witness and this king is a witness. No one had an accusation against me. In other words, there was nothing wrong with Samuel's leadership. He cheated nobody. He didn't mistreat anybody. He was representing the Lord very well. And he was going to make sure that they couldn't come back later on and say, Samuel, well, he cheated me or he took my ox. Well, why didn't you say it when you had the opportunity? See, this was a good point. This was a big point. And this teaches us something. This teaches us something that when we make bad decisions, we need to take personal responsibility. That is step number one. Step number one when we make bad choices is to take personal responsibility. He's sort of cutting them off, sort of, you know, at the crossroads saying, now, now he's not going to let them blame him for their poor choice. And you know why he's doing this? He knows the hearts of men. So often when we make bad choices, so often it's so easy to simply blame someone else, isn't it? I'm telling you what, that is the name of the game in our society lately. Everybody has found a way to be a victim, right? Well, he robbed a store. Well, yeah, he only did that, though, because his dad used to rob stuff. But he didn't make him rob the store now, right? Right? Well, I only acted out this way because of this, or he made me. I mean, you know, it's the most rudimentary thing. We see this in our children because it, apparently it's in, it's, it's in our DNA to do this, right? You get a group of kids together, and they'll all blame each other, right, for, for, for just about anything. Taking responsibility is not something we want to do. And as kids, you find out that when you take responsibility, you still get in trouble, so they take the shot at not taking responsibility. So they don't get in trouble. And it's, you know, this just seems to be. And, you know, this goes all the way back to the very first sin that ever happened. Adam and Eve, right? Eve was eating up on, on the apple. She talked to the snake. The snake talked her into it. She ate the apple. She took it to, she took it to Adam. Adam ate. God comes looking for him because now they feel guilty. They've got the shame of sin. They try and make themselves clothes, which was a terrible idea. Backfired big time. I won't tell you why. I'm going to leave you to find that out. But they're walking in the garden, and God comes down, and he says, Adam, where are you? Come on out. Where, where, where are you at? God knew where he was. He knew what happened. He calls him out. And once it's determined what happened, he turns to Adam, and he says, what happened? Well, I mean, he figured out what's happening. He said, Adam, what happened? What did Adam say? It's the woman you gave me. He blamed his wife and God at the same time. That's talent. The very first sin was the very first guy to blame someone else. Number one, it was her. It was her idea. She ate it. She told me it was fine. Number two, God, it's the woman you gave me. So you're kind of responsible here too. Wow. So often... We do. It's just, a, it's, it's just, it's like a snap thing. We, we, we look for someone to blame. I will tell you this, though. Healing will never happen until you take personal responsibility for your own actions. You will not get better. The cycle will not be broken until you learn to take responsibility for your own actions. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals a transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You know, this is why... When you go to, if you've ever seen somebody go to the, uh, 
um, drug or alcohol treatment, one of the very first things they make them or ask them to do is stand up, give their name, and whatever it is that they're into. So you might hear somebody say, hi, my name is Dave, and I'm an alcoholic, right? They say that right out the bound because the first thing is is to deny or to blame somebody else. But just taking responsibility, that's the big thing. You know, that is at the heart, that is the root of accepting the gospel right there. Before we can even be saved, we must first admit and take responsibility for our own sin. This is why it's important to confess your sins. You confess them before man, and if they are, if they are in front of man, then you confess them to man, but then you confess them to God. And, and you know, I, I always encourage people, you know, when we talk about sinning, most everybody will agree that they're a sinner. But we like to keep that general so that people don't find out exactly what those sins are. God already knows. And especially when we talk to him, it is important that we take full responsibility for our sin. Well, Samuel was going to make sure that at least they couldn't blame him. So now he's going to speak to them a little bit more. Verse 6 says, Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, but now deliver us from the hand of your enemies, and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Bedan, Jephthah, Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you've chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Samuel, now, after establishing the fact that it wasn't him that they were rejecting, it wasn't his leadership, it wasn't anything that he had done wrong, it wasn't that he didn't love the people, he now takes them for a trip down memory lane says, you guys know the scriptures, and indeed they did. They're Jews. They studied these things. They heard the stories all the time. They understood their own history. And so he just sort of takes them down. He says, first, uh, I want to establish one thing. It was the Lord that raised up Moses. Was it Moses that raised himself up? No. The Lord raised him up. Who raised up Aaron? The Lord did. Who brought them out of Egypt? The Lord did. Yes, he used Moses. Yes, he used Aaron. But God was the one that raised them up, sent them, empowered them, and then brought the people out. Now, if we remember through the book of Joshua, or rather through the book of Exodus, actually, it kind of began, began there. As soon as they were brought out of Egypt, they were constantly sinning, right? They would turn their backs on the Lord, and they, were, you know, they wanted to go back to Egypt, and there was all these issues out there. And then, then through Joshua, they brings them in. They take out Jericho. They win the battles of Israel. They divide up the land, and then they begin to serve false gods. Well, they really disobeyed God's command before that. And God's command was to go in there and take everybody out. They'd been given 450 years to repent. They did not. These people were sacrificing live babies on the, uh, on, the, on the red hot arms of their statue Molech. They were doing horrible stuff. God had determined that this was never going to continue. These people were evil and they had to be stopped. He used his own people to go in there and wipe them out. And he said, everything that has breath, that was his order. That was the mission. What did they do? They did it almost all the way. God says, if you don't do this, if you don't follow this out all the way through, just like sin, if you, don't get it rid, if you don't get rid of it all the way, it's going to come back. 
you're going to end up worshiping their gods, and this is going to be a problem for you. And sure enough, it was. They ended up worshiping their false gods, the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now, Baal was sort of the god of prosperity. So he was the god that controlled the weather, and so Baal, to serve Baal was, to, was, to, was sort of really just to try and get rich. It was like serving wealth or success. Ashtoreth was this goddess of fertility. So this was the way she was worshipped, were these large, you know, sexual perversion, that kind of stuff. So really nothing's changed from the days of Israel to, the day, to today. What are the two temptations for Christians to worship? The worship of prosperity or the worship of sex? It's, it's the two most powerful drives that, that, that pull us in the directions, you know, and every billboard's got something on it that pulls you towards sex, and every commercial's got something on it towards materialism. It's just what we live in. It's the world. But he says, when they did that, guess what happened? Bad things. They stopped following the Lord. It says, when you did this, it says, uh, when you went out of Egypt, the Lord met, so, or excuse me, verse 9, it says, and when they forgot the Lord God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera. They forgot him. So what did God do? He brought in an army to take them out, to put them into slavery, to cause hardship. You know what's really interesting about this is that we tend to think, and listen, what he's reciting and what he's focusing on are the righteous acts of of the Lord. When we think of righteous acts of God, oftentimes we think of the times that God delivered us, and indeed, he's going to deliver them. He says, I sent you these judges, and you know, the first judges that he sent, Jerubbabel, that's actually Gideon, that's another name for Gideon. Uh, Bedan, that's another name for Barak. Um, Jephthah and Samuel, these were judges that God sent to deliver the people of Israel, the saviors, actually. And so God did do great things, but did you know that the righteous act of the Lord was also to allow hardship to come into their lives. You know why he did that? He did that because they were beginning to drift away in relationship from him. And he knew that if he just simply sit back and let it happen, they would never come back. They'd end up completely far away from him, worshiping false gods. And, you know, so God allows hardship to come into their life. They make a bad choice that led to consequences that God allows in order for them to repent and come back to him. That's a righteous act of the Lord. And do you know why he does that? For God so loved the world... That's the way it starts. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. This tells us everything about God. He, does, he loves us too much to let us just walk away in sin and destroy ourselves. And so what we think is consequences and what we think is, is God's anger pouring out on us is actually his righteousness and his love not allowing us to get too far away to bring us back to him. That's a pretty good God. But you know what we tend to do when we get hardship in our life? Aside from blaming other people, sometimes we blame God. I know that when I went through the hardest time in my life, it was a relationship that had ended, something that I had poured an awful lot of effort into, and it was hard. You know, it was very difficult. This relationship ended, and I was devastated. It was really the first time that I had been rejected in such a way. And, and it was just something I was, I was working through, but I, was, I, was, I just remember I just remember being so hard to work through that, those, those period of months. There were, there were days I felt like I couldn't breathe. And, and I was just, I had such a hard job. I remember getting sent home from work because <laughs> I was essentially a danger to myself and other people. I wasn't sleeping, wasn't eating very much. And, and you know, I was groggy and frustrated and angry. And my captain pulled me aside and said, you need to pull yourself together. You need to go home. I remember it was kind of a low point, right? And I got so frustrated that God allowed that to happen in my life. I got so mad. I thought, God, you've got the power to do something about this. Why didn't you? Why did you let this happen? Why would you? And I started thinking, why did you do this to me? Like God was doing it. And I started going back through my life of all the bad things I've done, you know, Surely this is punishment for something I've done. And it didn't, I didn't have to go back very far to find something that I thought, well, then I guess I had this coming, right? Do a review of your own life. You'll find some sins there that you think, yeah, well. But did you know that it was through that hard time that I opened up my Bible for the very first time and, and read it, like really read it. Not, not go to church and listen to somebody preach. I mean, the first time I opened up my Bible to really see what it says. And do you know I read for so long that my neck hurt? It was like 3 o'clock in the morning when I finally closed it and decided I had to go to bed. I couldn't put it down. It was the first time. Listen, y'all, I graduated high school without ever having read a book. 
I, was, I took pride in that. I don't know why, but I did. I also got D's, by the way. I hated reading. I don't like reading, but that was the first time that I opened up the Bible and I read it. And I remember thinking, man, this is incredible. It was a book I couldn't put down. I read it nearly from cover to cover, and the Lord spoke to me so much. And I grew so much that people who hadn't seen me for six months were actually coming up to me and saying, man, what happened to you? What is wrong with you? You've changed. You're different. Circumstances in my life didn't change, but God had changed my life. He was changing everything about me. He was stripping these things off of me, and it was the most incredible experience I ever had. And, you know, I thought to myself, now I look back on this, and I thought to myself then, I wonder if God allowed this to happen so that we'd have this relationship now and then bring me back into this. And you know what? I, I'm convinced to this day. Well, first of all, let me freely admit, the relationship in the first place was a bad choice on my part. I knew it. Other people knew it. I thought I could save anybody. I was wrong. But that's the point. Did I make a bad choice that had led to consequences? Oh, yes, I did. But God rescued me out of those consequences when I finally had that relationship, and it was God's righteous act and his grace and his love that brought me back. And so he's reminding Israel of their history. This was their history, too. They served false gods. They ended up going into the hands of both Sisera and, and the Philistines and, and the king of Moab. I mean, there were several different times that they were in slavery. And every time they cried out to the Lord, once they finally repented, they said, we have sinned. We've forsaken the Lord. We've served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Now deliver us from the hand of the enemies, and we will serve you. And the Lord sent deliverers, judges, Jerubbabel, Bed, Bedan, Jephthah, Samuel, delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. So he's reminding them now of how many times God has delivered them. Now he brings it all the way up to the present and the choices they were currently making. He says, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was a king. <laughs> That's tough. Was there anything wrong with Samuel's leadership? No. Was there anything wrong with the way God was their king? No. And in fact, he even tried to warn them when they first came up with the idea. This is what a king is going to do. He's going to take your children. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your taxes. He's going to take all this. Day. He's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take. God doesn't do any of those things. God loves you. God blesses you with stuff. Do you really want to replace that with a, with a king who's going to do all these things? And the people are like, yep. Huh. Like a 16-year-old trying to buy a Corvette, you know? Are you sure you want a car that goes this fast? Yep. Are you sure you can afford the fuel? Yep. Right? I mean, this is a bad idea. Okay, you got the money, you can buy the car, and, you know, hopefully make it out the dealership. But So he reminds him. But it's interesting what he says next, verse 14. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord... When both you and the king reign over you, you, you will continue, excuse me, both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Even after making this choice, God's grace was extended to the nation of Israel to even have this choice of serving God or not serving him. He gave them two roads. And this is what will happen if you serve him. And this is what will happen if you rebel against him. This is, this is what you have. These are the choices you have. You know, it, it's just so apparent in this passage, the fact that God is even giving them this choice, that when we make choices that end up with long-term consequences, I think we must be reminded that God loves you. You got to be reminded of that. When you're dealing with some difficult stuff and you're tempted to blame God or ask God why, not only do you need to take personal responsibility, if you made a bad choice that led to consequences, you got to take responsibility first, but you need to remember that God loves you. And I think the best way to remember that is by going through your own history with God, because we tend to forget that. We tend to sort of just push that aside. We tend to minimize. It's, we, we, we sort of live in our minds in a place of what, what has God done for me lately? You know, like, I don't know, saved you from hell? <laughs> That's kind of a big deal. 
you know. Went to the cross, was whipped, beaten, crucified, you know, humiliated. Yeah, he did those things for you. Yeah, but can God save me from this? Yeah, I think he can. But perhaps he's holding off, waiting for you to arrive to this place where you can worship even though the circumstances in life are hard, but you need to be reminded that God loves you. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 said, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to take away our sins. Man, if we let that sink in at any given moment, it just changes how we, it, 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 well, for, for lack of a better term, changes how we suffer. It changes the suffering. It changes how we view life. We need to be reminded, we need to remember that God loves us. And so he gives them this choice, but he moves into verse 16. He says, now therefore, stand and see this thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So during the time of harvest, they, they, they didn't typically get any rain. Think, think late summer, uh, fall. This was the time of harvest. And they, they, rainstorms are not typical. In fact, if they did get rainstorms that time of year, it was actually kind of dangerous because the heavy rain and, and you know, winds would really damage the crops at that time. If you didn't have them harvested quite yet and they were still out in the fields, it could all be sort of wiped out. So it was really kind of a dangerous thing to happen. But just be so that they would know that this isn't just Samuel heaping on guilt or trying to talk to This isn't just a pastor up at the pulpit trying to make people feel guilty about their sins. He's like, I want you to know how serious this is, and, and, and God is going to sort of reinforce this. I'm going to pray, and today there's going to be a thunderstorm. Now, you know, you might sit back at that moment and be like, all right, cool, let's see if it happens, right? But when the thunder came, the people were like, oh, he's serious. When the thunder and the rain came, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, things got real at that moment. Two, uh, was it two weeks ago on Saturday, we had the men's conference on the same day as the women's conference. And everybody who was here knows that, that there was a bolt of lightning that hit right in front of the church. And, and Pastor Rich actually went back and reviewed our security cameras, and we kind of tried to see if we could figure out where it hit. It actually hit the parking lot right where that metal grate is in the road. And it was so loud that we thought, like, I mean, it sounded like a shotgun went off in the, in the youth room. Here's the funny part, though. I had sent Pastor Jack over from the men's conference to the women's conference to find out what their timing was in order to, uh, to try and time the ending of ours so we could all put the church back together and whatnot. And he came over, he got the timing, and he had just stepped out the door when the lightning hit, and it hit right in the parking lot. He never ran so fast. We got it all on camera, too. It was good. It was good. You'll have to ask him about that. It was good. But yeah, man, when thunder and lightning hit, yeah, you know how small you are in that moment. And so, the people now feared the Lord and Samuel. You know, this kind of goes back, though, to the hardness of their own hearts. It kind of shows how hard their hearts were because it's like, you know, it's like, oh, now they realize God's got power. It's like, well, didn't they know that before? Like, apparently their hearts were pretty hard. They were moved away from God, and it wasn't until a miracle happened that it finally got their attention. I do find it kind of cool, though, that, that what led to the repentance of the people was the word of God coupled with the power of God that led to repentance, man. And I just love to see, you know, on Sunday mornings when, when, when we put the gospel out and people come to church for the first time and the hand goes up, um, oftentimes you can, there's a struggling going on. And you can almost, sometimes it's even visible, you know, on the people's faces as they're sitting there. And I could just tell because it's not, I, I know that there's the word of God that's going out, but the spirit of God is bringing that conviction, you know, that it's true. Not, not condemnation, but conviction. And God works together with that. And, that. and man, you can just feel it and see it. And, and, and the release of joy that happens when someone's hand goes up and they pray that prayer, man, it is so, that's why we clap. Because a miracle just happened. 
I, I would submit to you that it is a bigger miracle for someone to humble themselves and repent and be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ than it is for, to say to somebody, stand up and walk, right? Somebody's quadriplegic, paraplegic, you say stand up and walk, that's a miracle, but it's a bigger miracle than when someone gets saved. And so the power of God has moved him to fear. Verse 19 tells us, and all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. <laughs> it must have been a bad thunderstorm. For we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Now they recognize, but I, it, still break, it still breaks my heart a little bit because they say, Samuel, pray for us and pray to your God. Notice how they didn't say our God. They didn't, you know, our Father. Please pray to our Father for us. You know, play, pray with us. No, 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 no. They weren't completely broken. They weren't completely repentant. They weren't completely humble. But they're on their way. Verse 20, it says, Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You've done all this wickedness. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because he has pleased, or it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Once again, Samuel reminds them of their choice. What do we do now? They've made the poor choice. They're, they have the result. Can't go back on it now. It's there. Samuel has said it was wicked in what you asked for. The motivation for the king was wrong. You've done wickedly. You have, you know, essentially God loved you. God has rescued you. He has even brought consequences to bring you in, and yet you asked for a king. You took him off the throne, and you've added a king to the throne. It was wrong, he says, and yet do not fear, but now double down. Give your life to the Lord. Fear him. Follow him. In fact, he says here four things. He says, serve the Lord with all your heart. And then he says, don't turn aside to idols, to, to, to things. He says, they won't do anything for you. In fact, they will, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to give this to the other side. Yes, they will do something for you, right? It's just not what you're looking for. They won't deliver on what you think they're going to deliver. And by the way, when I say idols, I say idols in a general term. I'm talking about those who are chasing money, those who are chasing success or finances or, or, or relationships. Or life is hard, and so now they're chasing alcohol or drugs or whatever it is that they're going to try and bring into their life to cope with different circumstances in life. You see, that's a poor choice because it only gives you short-term fulfillment. You know, alcohol does deliver a numbing you for a time, and then it brings a hangover. And if you do it often enough, it just brings alcoholism, and then you lose everything. See, that, that's, that's the road that it goes down. Drugs are the same way, and you can just about pick any sin on the compass. And so he's reminding them. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn towards these things. Don't mess with idols. And stay in fellowship. Notice how he said, I will not cease. I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. He says, I will also teach you the right way to go. Now, in those days, he sort of had a traveling ministry. He went around and he would teach the people. But this is what he's, this is what he's saying. I want to sum it up to you because it's kind of our third point. In making choices... You first take personal responsibility for your bad choices. Know that God loves you. And the beautiful thing about our Lord is that you can repent and obey and move forward. You don't have to live in the past. You don't have to dwell on your mistakes. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You just simply have to repent to the Lord. You come to him with your sin. You acknowledge it. You confess it. Pray for that forgiveness. Obey his word and stay in fellowship. That's the great thing about our God. No matter where you find yourself, no matter how many times you've blown it, no matter how many times you've sinned or gone back to that thing that you never wanted to go back to, God says, come back to me. I will forgive you. Let's move forward. Such an awesome thing. This week I had a time to spend with a friend of mine who had years ago gotten saved, but it not drifted away from the Lord, but had gotten pretty comfortable, I would say. And he came to me and he was sharing with me that he had really been backsliding in the last week or so. 
two weeks maybe. And for him, there was a particular issue that, that's kind of a trigger for him. And, 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 and he just kind of says, man, I, 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 I'm so frustrated at myself for going back to this. And, and so we talked a little bit, and I asked him how his devotions are going and how life is going. And while the devotions aren't going that well, and, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't been to church in, in a while, and, you know, things aren't, my life, my family's going, it's just everything seems like it's falling apart. I said, okay, so you're not reading your Bible, you're not praying, and you're not going to church. Do we need to start over again? I mean, this is kind of where life is, right? Things are falling apart, but you're not doing the things. I said, here's what we're going to do, okay? This is where it begins. First of all, you just acknowledge to me. You've repented. You, you've taken responsibility. The next thing we need to do is take this before the Lord because he stands ready and willing to forgive you and bring you back and put you back on the path. And it was so awesome because it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I was like, no, 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 no. Let's do it now. <laughs> Don't carry this way. How much longer do you want to be miserable? Let's do it today. And so we did. We prayed right on the spot. And this, this, this big old guy, I can't tell you who he was, big old guy, you don't expect him to cry. He just opened up, couldn't keep it back, man. And he just looked at me and smiled and he says, it was that simple. Yeah, it is. We complicate things quite a bit, but yes, it is that simple. And it is so awesome, man. You, like, you give it to the Lord and he takes that weight off of you, brings you back, and there's no greater feeling than knowing that you are right with Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this word. And, Father, I pray, Lord, that if there are anybody here tonight who is struggling, who is backslidden, Lord, who's made poor choices and then sort of suffering the, the consequences of it, Lord, I pray that tonight is the night that we take this weight off the shoulders, Lord, that we've come before you once again, that we give you our issues, our problems, all of our mess, that you're happy to listen to, that you're happy to forgive and love, put it back on the right track. Lord, I pray that the joy of salvation will be restored. I pray, Lord God, as they confess their sins to you, Lord, and get down on their knees to you and, and, and lay it all out once again, Lord, like they've done before, that, Father, that the joy, that your mercy, your grace will just flood their souls. A smile will return. And whatever they have to deal with in life, Lord, that you will help put back together. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you will fill us with your love, your, your joy, Lord, and your mercy as we go forth tonight, Lord. I pray that you will make us great missionaries for you as we enter the, battle, the battlefield again. As soon as we get past the mailbox of this church, we go right back onto the mission field. Father, I pray for great work. I pray, Lord, that we would love our enemies, love our friends, and just love people. But more than anything, Lord, I pray that our love for you is evident in all of our relationships, Lord, in obedience. I pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. And God bless you all. I will see you this weekend. Have a great week.